Tundra is located at the top of the world near the North Pole and covers a fifth of the Earth's surface in Canada, Russia, and other northern countries. The soil in the tundra is covered in permafrost year-round, allowing only sparse vegetation to grow and supporting little life. In this series, our intrepid ecologists journey into the tundra in order to illuminate its many mysteries. Welcome to Exploring the Tundra. I'm Peter Weisslaw, and as an ecologist, I'll be guiding you on your journey through one of the biosphere's most exciting ecosystems, the tundra. Now, we'll be experiencing moderate climate as it is the summer season. Well, here we are. This is the tundra. You three probably weren't listening earlier, so you may be wondering why it's not all cold and snowy. Again, the tundra has a summer season in which the climate is moderate. During this time of year, the population densities tend to either rise exponentially with no bound, or logistically with a carrying capacity. Would either one of you care to explain to our viewers? Well, it all begins with the sun. The sun is the major source of energy for life on Earth, and it's during the summer season where most of the sunlight is at its peak. So because of this, more sunlight is more produces are photosynthesizing. Then herbivores eat the nutrient-rich plants while increasing in population. Carnivores also increase dramatically. When there is an abundance of prey, it is this way that the energy from the sun moves through the food web from trophic level to trophic level. It starts it starts at the sun, makes it way to the consumers, and then reaches the top of the food. However, population size is always changing due to biotic and abiotic factors. Biotic factors, such as immigration and emigration, affect the density of a population and, on a larger scale, a community. Abiotic factors, such as habitat loss and pollution, caused by the no use of non-renewable resources, also have a large impact on the native species in these lands of food would also be detrimental to the entire community. Sometimes ecologists refer to this situation as limiting nutrients. You see, as James said, food passes through the food web, through trophic level, through trophic level. However, each consumer only absorbs 10% of what the previous consumer had. Thus, without proper nutrition, such a limiting factor could cause a decrease in population. The depths of the tundra. Today we will be looking at all sorts of fungi and bacteria, or in different plants and animals. I would really like to see a polar bear. As cute as they are, they are the fiercest predators of the tundra biome. Often it will prey on fish and seals. The polar bear also can be a victim of symbiotic non-mutual relationships with a parasite called Trichinella. This relationship is known as parasitism. I'm not so interested in bears, whether it be a polar bear or a grizzly bear. Personally, I like to see an arctic fox. The arctic fox preys on small animals that they can find, including lemmings, voles, ring seal pups, fish, and seabirds. However, the omnivorous animal also eats plants, as well, as well because of the low biodiversity in, in the tundra. Only a few species exist within the ecosystem, and there is always a low biomass of animals. So the arctic fox has adapted to rely on large biomass of plants, such as carrion, berries, and seaweed. Sometimes, an arctic fox may prey on leftovers of a polar bear. I don't really like animals at all. I'm most looking forward to the producers of the tundra, including arctic moss, arctic willow, caribou moss, diamond leaf willow, and the pask flower. Oh look, it's a caribou. The caribou is a species of deer that has thrived in the tundra. The creature immigrated from Europe and has found its niche here in the northern tundra. It's known to feed mostly off caribou moss. Caribou moss is our pioneer species because it was able to inhabit the tundra before any other life. Eventually, its presence fertilized the soil and allowed the caribou to feed off it and thrive to the current population of today. Then, primary succession and secondary succession allowed the primitive biome to flourish into the ecosystem that it is today. What was that you were talking about during commercial breaks? I don't really understand what you were saying about the nitrogen cycle and the carbon cycle. Could you explain that? Well, you see, Malik, the carbon cycle helps recycle carbon through the layers of the Earth. Carbon, as you know, is essential to all life. It's necessary in photosynthesis, and carbon also helps trap heat in the layers of the Earth in order to maintain temperature. Similarly, nitrogen is also essential to life, as it is used in chlorophyll molecules. The nitrogen cycle also helps to recycle nitrogen through processes including nitrogen fixation, assimilation, ammonification, nitrification, and denitrification. What a beautiful biome. Luckily, it's never been affected by desertification and biomagnification because of the few human interactions with this ecosystem. It's got a lot of renewable resources 
interesting animals and very cool plants. Well, I hope you enjoyed our show. But first, let's remember what we did today. We learned about food webs, natural cycles, predation, and lots, lots more. Wow. Hate to see this day come to an end.